running the markets for electricity, where every day it's bought and sold at a wholesale level, and through that is determined which power plants should be turned on and off through the day to provide the electricity that everybody needs. So that is my, that's what I do, and it's my background, why I was asked to say a few words here. Um, just very quickly, once upon a time, we're all through in our lifetime, you had a single utility that brought you the electric power, they owned the power plants, they owned the transmission lines, uh, the high voltage lines, they owned the distribution lines to your home, and their rates were set by a public utility commission who said in order for everyone to earn, investors to earn a certain return, here's what everyone's going to have to pay cents per kilowatt hour for their electricity. Very straightforward, very simple. Starting 30, 40 years ago, even with Jimmy Carter, all this began to shift in various ways. And the fundamental point was, you know, the only thing that really is a natural monopoly in the system are the wires. Nobody's going to have two separate wires coming to your home. You're only going to have one set of wires. So that has to be very carefully regulated. But on the other hand, the generation of electricity, actually building and owning and running power plants, can be a competitive process. People could build different kinds of power plants using different sources of fuel, have the right to put the power onto the grid, and they should be able to compete in the competitive marketplace. And so over the last 30, 40 years in the United States, this difference between the wires on one hand and generation on the other has evolved in different ways in different places, but nonetheless, at the end of it, we now have a much more fractured system where every individual component of the system is often owned by a different party, looking to their own market, their own regulations, and their own way in which they serve consumers. So it makes for a much more complicated world, and that's one reason why we're seeing the offers we have in right today. In theory, hopefully in practice, it ultimately is a better world where consumers have more choices, hopefully power prices stay low, but certainly gives the opportunity for renewable power uh, and other things we like to have a greater opportunity that might otherwise be the case in the old system. So what we have right now in the PJM territory is you have the old line utilities that still own the wire, and they charge for that, and you see that in your bill, and Paul's going to talk through the bill and how that looks. You also have companies that own the power plants, who are not the utilities, but are often national companies, sometimes local companies. They may own a single power plant, they may own a single wind farm, or they may be national companies that own a whole series of power plants, may own thousands of megawatts of capacity in a single region. Every day, and this is true in New England, I suspect it's true in PJM, on a given day, every five minutes, there is an operating auction for electricity, where at the wholesale level, power is purchased at prices that move constantly through the day, depending upon the demand and supply of electricity and the price of, that has to be paid to the power plants to run at different times of the day. It's a very automated, very sophisticated, very complicated system, but it works to make sure that the power is provided. Separate from all of that, and that's, the, that's sort of the physical world of all the power plants, separate from all of that is the financial world. And in the financial world sits a particular kind of company we're going to use the word supplier here. But they're basically financial players. And what their job is is to say, we're going to talk to individual consumers and try <coughs> to get them to sign up with, with my company. And I'm going to aggregate that number of consumers that I can sign up. And then I'm going to go out and purchase electricity in the wholesale market to meet the demands of my customers. But the thing to think about is that these suppliers, by and large, are simply taking financial obligations. They're saying to you, if you are willing to sign up with me and pay a certain cents per kilowatt hour for the fixed contract, that's all you have to do and you will get your power. If ultimately, I'm able to buy the power for less than that, I make money. If I have to buy the power in the wholesale market for more, I lose money. That's my problem, that's my business. This is the price you're going to get. There are other contracts that Paul's going to go through that are variable and so forth, but the key point I'm just trying to make is that the supplier takes on that financial function. They may also own power plants in some cases, but often they do not. Their core purpose is to manage the aggregation of all the customers and to provide the pricing to them for the electricity that is purchased in the market. And that is what brings the consumer, and all of us consumers here today, is to hear about this category of suppliers and what their issues are and the opportunities
opportunities there are to potentially buy more renewable power or to potentially save some money, but also the risks and the cautions that we as customers should be mindful of when we think about this and be aware that you know these are often small companies and they sometimes get you know there are issues about them and we want to make sure that we feel we're going to get a good deal and a reliable uh, opportunity to buy power on our own. So that's all I wanted to say by way of introduction. Uh, turn it over to Paula and uh, let her really go through the details of how this is going. If I could interrupt just before Paula begins, I just wanted to mention that while we're calling this a presentation, we really have in mind that this be more of a discussion. So if at any time during Paula's presentation you have a question that's germane to the information that she's presenting, please don't hesitate to raise your hand and let's, uh, let's try to make it uh, more of a free flow give and take where we can both share our concerns and also any experiences we might have. <coughs> Paula's got roughly about 30 or 40 minutes of material that she's going to talk through and we definitely will have some dedicated question and answer time at the end. But feel free to interrupt at any time if you've got a question that you think that you want to raise then. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I won't be able to see you up here. So. Oh, that's right. Yeah. I, forgot you, I forgot you was filming. Um, so I really appreciate uh, your coming out and um, talking about this. It, it is still a, a, bill to a big topic, and I want to thank Bernie for um, giving you that kind of back background information. Uh, he is your local source of information if you want to know about how this whole kind of competitive world uh, is operating. Uh, my presentations are going to be more uh, ground focused uh, in terms of looking at how the, the real world works and, and how you engage with suppliers. Uh, Kurt here is going to be handling my um, uh, slides here. Uh, just to let you know kind of what the topics are, I'm going to explain, take a minute to explain like who am I and what do we do. Um, I'm going to skip over the restructure state. Bernie kind of talked a little bit about that. Um, I was asked to talk a little bit about the PEPCO bill, uh, particularly because there are um, some aspects that um, relate to the supplier charges. So I'll talk a little bit about that, and then I'm going to go through for electricity and gas suppliers in the um, state of Maryland, licensing rules, consumer protection rules, things to watch out for. Uh, and then I will talk a little bit about kind of renewable energy and how that plays out with uh, supplier contracts um, or offers that you may see. Uh, a little bit about regulatory enforcement by the Public Service Commission that oversees the suppliers. Um, so we've, we've got a little bit, I've got about 30, 35, 40 minutes um, to talk. And again, uh, as John said, um, Please raise your hand if we're going through things. You've got some particular questions you want me to, you know, talk about or uh, respond to. So. And you know, you've got you brought some materials, and we'll also make available uh, online for folks who give us their email a lot of this information, so you don't have to write down every single note on the. Uh, uh, that's a great point. Um, up here, some of you have already taken these things. Um, we do have a contracting guide uh, if you're thinking about. Uh, contracting with electricity or gas suppliers, it's up at the table, uh, some other materials. Uh, don't have enough copies for, for 60 uh, folks, but they are online on our website, and our website information is up there as well. Uh, in addition, uh, certainly feel free to contact me directly or contact John uh, if, if we need additional copies, or if um, you know uh, anybody that uh, would need a hard copy. We'll be very happy to send out hard copies as well uh, to folks if you think uh, they would like to see them. So uh, why don't we uh, go ahead? Uh, just very briefly, uh, I head an independent state agency. Some of you may be familiar with it. I'm guessing that most of you have never heard of us. Uh, we've been around since 1924, the oldest uh, utility <coughs> consumer advocate office in the country. Most of them were set up in the 1970s. Uh, our statutory mission is to represent residential utility customers across the state. So this is, uh, <coughs> this is Pepco is one part of our area, uh, but we deal with electricity, gas, telecommunications customers, uh, and also private water companies. Uh, we still have some of those in the state. 
uh, based, uh, most of our uh, advocacy or work is done in front of the Public Service Commission. That is the independent state agency that regulates utilities. So that would be Pepco, Washington Gas Light Company, um, and all of the other uh, utilities across the state. These companies are heavily regulated, uh, and so eight, probably 80% of our work uh, is in litigation in front of the Public Service Commission. Uh, we also represent uh, customer interests in front of federal agencies, the Federal Energy Regul uh, Regulatory Commission that handles interstate stuff, the FCC. Uh, we also, through our National Association, are pretty active there as well. Um, we do take uh, cases up on appeal, or have to deal with other people's appeals in the courts. Uh, we are down uh, before the General Assembly uh, during the legislative session and work with the network of state and local agencies across the state, including many uh, in Montgomery County. Uh, again, just FYI, I've left a, a resource guide that uh, also talks about resources for uh, utility bill assistance in Montgomery County. We do this for every single county in Baltimore City, uh, an update from every year. So uh, these are all of the agencies that operate in your county. Um, we go, uh, next. Uh, okay, very briefly, um, Bernie talked about the fact that Maryland, like many other states, uh, became a restructured or deregulated state. Uh, it really is not deregulated, it really is restructured. Uh, in the sense that uh, they kind of split the distribution uh, and supply functions of Pepco, and I'll just talk about Pepco very specifically. This was back in 1999, so it was about 13 years ago. Uh, Pepco was uh, sold off its generating plants that it used to own um, at the time. Uh, so Pepco is called kind of the wires company. If you're a washing gas customer, it's the pipes company. A similar thing has happened um, with the gas <coughs> utilities as well. Uh, so the wires or pipes uh, part of their company, it is heavily regulated uh, by the Public Service Commission. If they want a rate increase, and Pepco always wants a rate increase, uh, they have to go in front of the Public Service Commission and we go in and represent residential customers um, like we're doing in a case right now. <laughs> We've dealt with two from Pepco in the past year. Uh, these uh, involve the, kind of the distribution system, which kind of hooks up your houses, and also the transmission system, which is the one that goes farther out and kind of connects, uh, does the wider connection with the wires. Those are the high voltage lines that you see uh, going up and down uh, certain areas. Uh, the thing to keep in mind is that Pepco also does provide electricity supply. Uh, probably to about 70% of Pepco residential customers at this time, a little bit more. Uh, so they do still act as a supplier with something called standard offer service. Uh, and again, this is a reg still is a regulated service because Pepco is a regulated company. Uh, but they go out uh, into the market, uh, they do this twice a year, uh, and solicit bids for um, two-year contracts on a ladder, what they call a ladder basis. Uh, this happens in October, happens again in April of each year. This happens with the other utilities, uh, and they get bids. Bids come in, uh, probably enter into contracts with about five or six different companies, and uh, then it has to go in front of the Public Service Commission for oversight or approval. Our office, again, kind of monitors to see if there are any what we consider to be anomalies or problems with that bid solicitation process. Um, <coughs> With regard to the energy suppliers, as Bernie was talking about, these are companies, these are uh, competitive companies uh, that are allowed to operate in the state of Maryland to serve all customers, including residential customers. Uh, and they uh, are subject, they've got to be licensed. The Public Service Commission is the agency uh, that issues the license for these companies and oversees their operation in the state of Maryland. So some of the things we're going to be looking at are license requirements, consumer protection rules, and kind of dispute mechanisms. Yes? Is, is it safe to assume that the uh, PEPCO is the default? If you don't choose, you're going to get banned? Yes. Um, you, and, and that is fairly typical in recent. You've got about 21, 22 states that are restructured in, in the United States. The rest of the um, states have remained um, kind of the way they traditionally have been. The utility is the distribution company and the supply company. Uh, Texas is a little bit unusual. They basically forced everybody off the utility. 
uh, a, a number of years ago, so they kind of operate differently. Uh, most states, uh, utility um, will be the default supplier and, um, until or unless a customer says, I want to enter into an agreement with another company. Yes. And so I mean, this sounds very basic, but if, if you have a different supplier, do you still make the payments separately? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, and I'll, I'll be going through that. There, there's a little bit of confusion. Um, Pepco will, yeah, uh, about that particular um, aspect. Pepco is the distribution company. <coughs> it's running kind of the wire system. It is a monopoly. It's heavily regulated. Uh, whether you choose a supplier or not, Pepco is your distribution company. And um, you will be getting a bill for the distribution service. You cannot get the supply service if you don't have a way to distribute the supplies. But if you get a bill from a supplier, then you should be suspicious maybe there's a scam in At this point in time, almost all, and we'll talk a little bit about billing um, down the line, but at this point in time, almost all suppliers will use Pepco as their billing agent. And when we talk, when we're going, actually when we're going through this bill, and I'll, I'll show you in a couple of slides, the, um, when you, what you will see on a Pepco bill, if you are using a supplier, is a piece of the bill that sets out the supplier charges. So um, they can issue their own bill, but we, uh, it is beneficial actually for them to use Pepco to do the billing for them. Um, I was asked, to, I'm going to switch gears just a little bit before we go into this um, discussion about consumer protection and licensing. I was asked just to briefly address the Pepco bill. I know you all see it. You probably said, oh, why the hell is she talking about what the Pepco bill looks like? Uh, the information on it can sometimes be confusing in terms of, you know, particularly with regard to what is the distribution side of the bill, what is the supply side of the bill. Uh, one thing I did want to point out, um, Pepco is going to come out with a new bill layout in the next month or so. Uh, it will have, in many ways, the same kind of information that you see. It's going to be displayed somewhat, you know, somewhat differently. Uh, they do have a tutorial um, up on that uh, link, uh, so you can kind of walk through what the bill looks like and, and kind of see what the information is. Uh, as you can see, the basic information, the account number, address, uh, bill issue date, uh, it does um, on that first page let you know if, you've got a, if it's a final bill, if, if you've got a past due bill, um, there should be a reminder notice right up at the top. One of the, um, the things that you will see, which is new, is a bar graph with 24 months of energy usage data. Um, so that will appear on that front page of the bill so that you can see uh, Say in, in December 11, you know, 2011 versus December, two, well, December 2012 versus December two, uh, 2013, what your usage was, um, and it will be over a 24-month, moving 24-month period. So that will be helpful in terms of kind of taking a look at your energy usage at least on a monthly basis. Um, the contact information, and um, there are also yes, for some folks you will see special billing arrangements, uh, budget billing which is a way um, program to kind of even out the payments that you make uh, and you can choose to kind of enter into that program. So that kind of flattens, instead of being billed the actual amount uh, based on the, the usage for a particular month, for a period of a few months, they, they may decide, okay, this is your average usage, you'll get a bill for $200 a month, $200 a month, $200 a month, Every few months, they'll do kind of an adjustment to true up. <coughs> Some people like this because it's a way to reduce volatility, whether it's in the winter time, if that's when you get hit because of electric heating bills, or in, you know, in the summertime. Yes? Um, you mentioned earlier about, um, you just happened to mention an estimated bill. I didn't think they did that anymore. I thought they had, because of those new meters, I thought they could tell exactly what we well, with the smart meters, and they have been mostly um, deployed, you know, here in the Pepco territory. Um, some, some, that is the case. The smart meters, when they're functioning properly, are sending, you know, when they're working, will be sending information back and forth. Uh, historically, um, there could be problems if there's not manual um, meter reading, uh, and if it's not done uh, properly. 
but to the extent that there is a problem with the equipment or you know some other thing that you still on occasion going forward may see some estimated bills and i think i don't think 100 percent. what i'm saying is just because there are smart meters coming in with digital communication <laughs> Uh, I don't think anybody will say that there is actually 100% perfect rel you know, reliability for exchange of information. You will uh, see estimated bills uh, far, far less you know, than you did in the, in, in the past. But I put that because uh, they actually have flagged on that bar graph, just to let you, you know, if you have an estimated bill in that 24 months, it's going to show up. Uh, as you know, kind of an estimate. Does it really distinguish? I no, mean, it does. It does not distinguish. It does, so I mean, it's going to show up, but you won't know that that's it's, an estimate. You'd have to go back, for, you know, probably, and you know, on, go back on your bills for two for two years. They're not going to show on the bar graph. It's not going to say like A for actual, E for estimate from say 2012 or 2013. I see, but it'll show what your bill was that year. So it, it will show your energy use. Exactly. No, when you're looking at them, you're just solely talking about the bar graph right now. Right, uh, that's what I'm talking yeah. about. Yeah, all that is not showing the bills, just showing usage, not dollars. It shows kilowatt hours. And, is it, and it may be actual kilowatt hours, and it may be estimated kilowatt yeah, hours, and, and you wouldn't know. Probably won't be actual, though. In almost all instances, the vast majority of times, you're, it's, it's, it's actual. I, I, th I think we're probably, we don't want to go too far down on something that is um, one of the least likely things to happen. I think particularly going forward if, with the smart meters, it's going to be mostly actuals. The reason I put that there is because they have you know, flagged that just to let people know that if you had an estimated bill in December 2012 and it's showing on the bar graph, they're not going to flag it for that, you know, that was an estimated bill. I wouldn't worry about it. You know. I wouldn't worry about it. I was just yeah. wondering. Um, yeah. Do you, will they have any weather adjustments to degree days or something so that if you're looking at my bill this August and it's a whole lot higher than last August, but really it was because there are more hot days? No. You know, that's uh, the, this, this is raw. <coughs> as far as I understand it, it's just kind of raw data. Uh, they're not going to weather normalize it or try to, you know, <coughs> try to make those types of adjustments. So again, it's a piece of information. It's not full or total information, but that will give you kind of a sense over two years um, how your usage is going up. Obviously, with the smart meters that are, have been in, installed in, in homes, um, there's going to be a lot more data or information that's going to be communicated back to the utility. And you know, over time, you'll have a better, um, potentially better idea of your usage pat pattern. Yes. If they're getting real-time data um, from the smart meters, will there be a way for the user to log in, like you can at our bank and so forth, and see what we're using rather than having to wait for someone else to ask for a paper bill? Can we log in to see what you know, our usage is? Is it all, you know? I mean, I, I don't think that that is anything that's, you know, that's currently available. There are, in you know, basically, uh, plans in place to be able to use, you know, kind of the data that they're getting over time. At this point in time, you are going to be issued monthly bills based on monthly usage. Um, they do have separate programs, for example, uh, what they call a, a critical peak pricing program, which operates uh, for these peak time rebates um, in the summertime. Your bills will show monthly usage at this point based on your monthly usage. The website information, my guess is, is perhaps going to be more um, granular, you know, as we move forward with the smart meters over time. And, and that is part of, PEPCO participates in something I believe called, the, uh, it's the Green Button Program from the Department of Energy. And part of that is to, um, again, going forward, enable better access to specific information about your usage. In your household. Yes. I uh, just I brought my recent bill. Okay, and, and but keep in yeah, some of this information is not gonna match. Oh no, it says um, that with the smart meter you have hourly data available for you. So I'm to see okay. if you're in touch with this year. Sometimes since I deal with all utility across, I'm not sure where they are at a particular point in time. So if it's there's your answer, the uh, the hourly data, you know.
you know, is available. This is some, um, our utilities are in different places in terms of deploying and installing the meters. Uh, so the hourly data is available on the website. Um, you're going to just see kind of summaries um, on the bill, and it, this is just kind of total information, payments, unpaid balances, new charges. And this include this is going to be information that combines distribution and supply charges. And so that was really my primary reason for flagging, um, flagging that. Um, what really can cause some confusion are the, the, the detail pages. These are like pages two and three of, the, of your, your bill. Um, and you know, it, it's helpful to kind of take a look at it. The rate schedule is just simply, if you're a residential customer, that's what your schedule is. Um, the meter information, that's just gonna tell you kind of if you've got some questions about when your meter was read or what the, the, the time frame is it, you know? Sometimes it's 28 days, sometimes it's 30 or 31 days. Um, delivery, you're gonna see this like delivery charges. That um, is the charge for the use of the distribution system. They say that they use the word delivery, but it's the distribution system, the wires. Uh, I just wanted to point out that sometimes there's some confusion about what those components are. There is a fixed a customer charge. This is a fixed amount. It does not vary based on your usage. Uh, some of the um, approved revenues are going to flow through that fixed charge, uh, and it is a, that fixed charge is set by the Public Service Commission inside of a rate case. Uh, those fixed charges have gradually been increasing over time. Uh, the energy charge, uh, and it, they use the word energy charge, again, it, it's a little confusing here, but it's part of the distribution system charge. Uh, and that is volumetric, but that means it's based on your actual usage. So they are actually they're collecting the bulk um, of the revenues um, to run your distribution <coughs> system through a volumetric charge. And I think that's kind of where sometimes there is confusion. Uh, it will, so if you're, the less that you, less you use, the less you'll pay on, uh, on a volumetric basis towards the distribution cost. Um, the more usage you have, the more you're gonna pay. Um, there, you're also gonna see lots of taxes, franchise taxes, you've got a county energy tax, uh, gross receipts tax, uh, those are all passed through the customers. The EUSP charge is a uh, universal service charge for um, an, an energy assistance program for low-income customers. And the environmental uh, and environmental surcharges, uh, those again are based on usage. The environmental surcharge is used to fund uh, something called the Power Plant Research Program. And they do a lot of work on energy planning and also on the transmission systems. Um, so it's funded, the Power Maryland are the uh, the name or brand for all of the energy efficiency programs in the state of Maryland. Supply charges, you're gonna see PEPCO. If PEPCO is uh, giving you the energy supply, you're gonna see it, it's standard offer service, and it includes the generation cost, which is the supply, uh, and transmission. Because in addition to the distribution system, you have to kind of get it into the distribution system, that is transmission. And so there is a cost to that that is regulated by FERC and it's passed through to customers. If you are using a supplier, uh, they are referred to as third party suppliers or you're gonna see something called TPS um, on the bill. And that will show up uh, in one place as just kind of a total. Uh, but that total will include the cost of the generation. If you have a contract, it's a fixed price or it could be a variable price, we'll talk about that. The transmission costs, and in some cases, some of the suppliers have an additional monthly charge. Could be $4.95 a month, $5 a month. Again, we'll talk about that. You need to be aware that's part of the cost of uh, the supply. Uh, so the total will include those three components. And then uh, one thing I just wanted to mention, and then I think, I believe on the new bill, the page three, you might see some further detail on the supply charge for doing that kind of breakout. Yes? On the last slide, it looks to me like we're being charged three places for transmission. Um, no, pay. because under the supply charge. Right, and the retail suppliers, but then also is it under delivery charges, the six 
monthly amount, isn't that also essentially for a customer charge? No, that the customer charge and the energy charge, what they're simply doing, these are the revenues <coughs> that the Public Service Commission has approved for, for PEPCO to receive. But what PEPCO is essentially just the <coughs> The delivery charge is for the distribution system. So there's a difference between you're looking out here and seeing those distribution wires connecting everything. The transmission that I'm talking about in supply, it, you know, in order, you're, you're basically going from generating plants to a transmission system to a distribution system to your house or business. So the transmission system, if you go out and you're traveling around, you see those high voltage, when I say high voltage, those are the big systems. You, ha you basically have to get, a, at some point, from a generating plant into a transmission system. And then it breaks down, goes through the distribution system owned by Pepco, and then it goes to your house. So the distribution stuff is in the delivery charge. So who owns the transmission line? Uh, part of those are owned if they're in trust state by, because there are different sizes, by Pepco. Um, but we're talking uh, these interstate systems also. Those are uh, anything that has to do with an interstate system is regulated by FERC. FERC, sets th FERC is the federal agency that regulates interstate commerce with regard to utilities, interstate transmission. Uh, and once they approve a charge on a transmission line, it's just passed through to customers. So part of our bill goes to that too? The transmission piece of it, when you're looking at the supply, whether it comes from Pepco or it comes from a retail supplier, in order for them to get the supply to you eventually, they've got to, they've got to send it through the wires. So th there is going to be a transmission piece, whether you use Pepco as a supplier <coughs> or you use a supplier. It's not, you know, you're paying for the cost of the supply, you're also going to be paying for a little bit of transmission. That, that's, I, I, that's the difference. Um, so the $64,000 question, is it now cheaper than it was in 1999? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're right, it's a $64,000 question. And um, looking at all of the reports depends on who you talk to. Uh, the Compete Coalition, uh, which is a national organization, will issue issues tons of reports and tells you that you are paying less. The um, the there are a number of other organizations, including the American Public Power Association, that has put out a number of reports, and other organizations will tell you that on average, and these are all national averages, um, that you're paying more. <laughs> uh, I recently, uh, a report was uh, issued a couple of months ago uh, that I still haven't read in detail. I, I keep meaning to you on, on the, the state of the restructured states. Basically says it's kind of a wash. Um, people may end up in entering, and I'm, uh, entering into contracts for a variety of reasons, you know, at this point in time. But uh, Bernie may have a, have a different uh, different well, perspective. Really do, right? Part of the answer is there's been an enormous shift in the sources of power, fuel to begin with, okay? And if you go back to 1999, you would have found a lot more coal and a lot more oil to be used. And now that's been almost
exceeds that, exceeds out exactly what the impact is of deregulation and all these other factors in movement. But the underlying commodity price of the fuel is really huge in the issue. And, I, and, and you need to really do separate out those two pieces. Um, and as an example, um, back in the, say, um, 2007, 2008 time frame in the state of Maryland for residential customers, average bills. Um, I know PG&E's was about $2,000 a year for residential customers on an annual basis. Pepco's, um, and it's slightly different, was in the, within that range. 2013, we're looking at bill average bill. Um, again, PG&E's is just sort of a little bit simpler, but it's less than $1,700 on an average basis. That is so, and this is um, for supply coming from the utility. But it gives you a sense of the range what Bernie was just talking about. That is, that is a function of what's going on in the wholesale market. It's a function of gas being che you know, cheap because of the fracking. It has nothing to do, frankly, whether it's the utility buying it or whether it's the retail supplier. You know, the whole national regional uh, uh, kind of supply uh, mix has changed. So prices for residential customers, and I'm focusing on residential customers only, um, have, you can see have just come down with regard to supply. It doesn't matter, in a sense, who you're dealing with. Um, your question as to <laughs> when you see lower bills uh, over time from retail <coughs> suppliers versus the um, utilities, sort of so whether their particular actions are driving price reductions is much more complicated and that's why I'm saying you've got lots of reports saying on average nationally, yes, it has been helpful. Other reports saying no, it hasn't, you know, hasn't really done anything. So we do see, we have seen a price reduction, but it, it's not a function necessarily of what's going on. I have another question. On page three of my petrol bill, it says that the electricity is being charged for and supplied by the standard office service. Correct. Now that implies the pep this is Pepco electricity. Pepco is Pepco's supply to you. You're purchasing purchasing it purchasing it from Pepco. It is called standard offer service in Maryland. In other states they refer to it sometimes as default service. But SOS or standard offer service is, is Pepco supply to you. I see. So it's, it's between me and Pepco to decide to find out why it is not an independent company, which I thought I'd signed up for. <laughs> if you thought you signed a contract with a supplier, yes. um, we can talk later. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we might want to um, those questions a little bit so Paul can get through more of her slides, just given the time, and then we'll have time at the end for all we'll, we'll talk, we'll talk about that later, but what, what do you want to do about that? Um, yes? Yeah, <laughs> sorry, this, um, <laughs> keeping in mind Kirk's admonition, I just want to say one thing before we get off the billing topic. Keep in mind, too, when you have separate suppliers and separate distributors, that you can run into sort of strange billing anomalies, like I just had an example where my November bill from Pepco was much lower than I expected it to be. And I was really shocked because it was a cold month. I would have used a lot of electricity for heat in our house. And it turns out that when I looked at the bill closely, it was because my supply company had not provided the usage information to Pepco, so it was a zero for that month. And then when my December bill rolled around just recently, it was much higher than I would have expected. And that's because two months worth of usage rolled into that one bill. So you, when you have separate suppliers and distributors, you have to be mindful that you may run into those sorts of strange things as well. Yeah, I mean, with regard, and we'll talk about uh, the supplier billing a little bit later, uh, but when you do see uh, a su supplier charges on your bill, and if you do have a contract with, a, uh, with an energy supplier, as I said, um, in almost all instances, they'll use Pepco as the billing agent. So it will show up in the bill. But it is up to that company to get that information to Pepco. If they don't get the information to Pepco, uh, what John just described uh, is going to happen. Or if they give inaccurate information to Pepco, uh, you can 
have some problem with that as well. Um, again,